speaker will be Dr. Nelson, looking at uh, long distance control of smooth muscle excitability. Dr. Nelson, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, can you see my slides? Yes, we can. Okay, Thank great. You. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, it's great to be here in front of my screen. Um, I want to thank David Eisner for inviting me and all the work that John and Eduardo and others have done to make this happen. I um, was challenged to talk about calcium signaling and EC coupling and smooth muscle since we did most of it in the 90s. I thought it might be interesting for people to have a like uh, an oldies tour, but I, th I thought maybe I'd present something newer that does include smooth muscle, but the smooth muscle is a recipient of electrical signals through the endothelium. And so, um, give you a little bit of background. What's also going to do in the context of small vessel disease of the brain. So this shows just an illustration of simulating neural activity in the brain. Every time a flash goes off, a neuron's working, and it demands blood to be delivered uh, within seconds and precisely and rapidly to the active parts of the brain. And this goes on in you and me for years and decades. Uh, without us thinking about it too much or at all. And then over time, and depending on disease, this starts to degrade. And most types of diseases in the brain, Alzheimer's and small vessel disease, the first things that are observed are deficits in cerebral blood flow. So I want to show some evidence linking to smooth muscle about what goes wrong in two types of small vessel diseases and Alzheimer's. Um, so a little bit of um, background, small vessel disease in the brain is a major cause of smoke, stroke and dementia. Impaired brain blood flow precedes overt clinical uh, effects, which I just mentioned. There's at the moment no therapy to small vessel disease, and the therapeutic technology is needed. And I'd like to provide evidence that there might be a possibility through a lipid PIP2 as a therapeutic approach to rapidly restore normal blood flow in disease. So a little bit about phosphatidyl inositol 4,5-bisphosphate, PIP2. It's, in a, it's a, a minor lipid on the inner leaflet of the plasma membrane. Um, it's an agent that can enhance blood flow and disease, as I'll show you. It's critical for small um, brain vessels to sense neural activity, and PIP2 is absolutely required for the activity of the strong immunorectifier potassium channel in capillary endothelial cells, and this potassium channel is, a, is one of the sensors of neural activity in the brain. So a little bit of background. Uh, this has been known for quite a while from the work of Don Hilgeman showing that PIP2 activates the immorectifier KR2.1 channel. And then Rod McKinnon um, showed the structure of it shown on the right and where the PIP2 um, uh, binds on the inner leaflet. And so without PIP2, the ion channel is there, but not functional. And Colin Nichols also showed for, for KR2.1, which is the ion channel in endothelial cells. Um, and it also radiates a variety of other transporters, including endocytosis. So a little bit of high uh, orbit overview. Normal health, as I mentioned, uh, neural, neurons are active all the time. They demand energy to, to feed the sodium pump and other ATPases. And, these, and then the, the, the vasculature responds by increasing blood flow. In small vessel disease and in Alzheimer's, both in humans and the mouse models I'll show you, there is a, a, a deficit in blood flow um, delivery upon neural activity. And the blood flow delivery upon neural activity is called functional hyperemia, meaning the neurons are functioning, hyper goes up, emia blood, so blood flow goes up in that part of the brain that's active. And um, I'll show you that, at least in our mouse models, PIP2 reverses the blood flow deterioration. A little bit of background for all you neuroscientists out there um, that never thought there were actually muscle cells in the brain. Uh, a human brain has about 1,000 miles of blood vessels. Um, seen here is a vascular cask. And um, on the surface of the brain are peel arteries, and they dive orthogonally into the cortex, and they form this vast network of capillaries. And this is the majority of blood vessels in the brain, capillaries. 
a, a capillary is about as about one twentieth the width of a human hair, and it's in close proximity to every neuron. So it makes capillaries the ideal uh, uh, vessel to sense neural activity. And capillaries are composed of endothelial cells, much like tacos, back to back, and composed in the majority blood vessel in the brain. So. But also, all endothelial cells are electrically coupled. So if you look at this cast here, you can think it's almost like electrical circuit for the brain where electrical signals are being sent through the endothelium from the capillaries upstream to the arterioles to tell the smooth muscle cells to dilate. And, that, and the dilation is caused by hyperpolarization, as Sue Ray talked about earlier, and um, a decrease in intracellular calcium and smooth muscle relaxation. So it's almost a little over 100 years ago, August Crow, a Danish physiologist, won the Nobel Prize for his studies of capillaries. And if um, I recommend reading his Nobel lecture, it's very interesting. Um, some aren't, but his is. And one of the things he said in it, the puzzle, in what way can the capillaries be excited? Chemical, electrical, and mechanical. I'll show you a little bit of both chemical and electrical during this talk. So here's an overview of what we think is happening. Here are the capillaries. Neurons are active and either directly or through astrocytes, increase perivascular potassium, which then activates the inward rectifier 2.1 channels, which then cause a hyperpolarization. And we measure the membrane potential in these cells and it's about minus 35 millivolts and can go up to with 10 millimolar potassium can go up to minus 60 millivolts. This then goes through gap junctions. This ion channel is also activated by hyperpolarization. So the, turn, the hyperpolarization turns on channels in adjacent cells, and as it goes upstream, it propagates and regenerates until it hits the smooth muscle cells, which then travel through gap junctions, hyperpolarize, turn off, deactivate calcium channels, calcium goes down, dilation, and red blood cell are then delivered downstream into the capillary bed. Another sort of way of looking at it, neural activity, perivascular potassium goes up. And we're talking about levels that only need to go up from three to six millimolar or so. Electrical signals go upstream. In fact, the PLRs on the surface also dilate in response to this electrical signal. A little bit about small vessel disease. Um, um, we've had some a Leduc Foundation grant and a European Union grant looking at this topic with collaborators in, in Germany and France, um, UK, and um, in, in the United States. Small vessel disease is a leading cause of age-related cognitive decline. It's responsible for at least 45% of the dementia um, because ischemic lesions in the deep parts of the brain, such as the thalamus, they're also really devastating deep um, intracerebral hemorrhages on um, other types of uh, um, um, causes of small vessel disease. And there are also um, a number of monogenic causes of small vessel disease. The one that we study is catacyl, cerebral autosomal dominant arteriopathy with subcortical infarcts and leukoencephalopathy. Uh, this is the most common monogenic cause of small vessel disease. About 1 in 50,000 people have the mutations in the NOTCH3 gene that's responsible for um, this, this disorder, this disease, um, and it's autosomal dominant. And as of yet, no treatments. So just to, if you want to read stuff, uh, we published this recently in PNAS showing that PIP2 cor uh, corrects the cerebral blood flow deficits in small vessel disease, in particular cat meaning catacyl, by re rescuing capillary inward rectifier channel activity. Um, and it was also on news and views. Uh, so without showing the data, the typical, I'll show you some data later on with another mouse model. But what we do is we look at functional hyperemia by making a cranial window on the mouse's head. We then wiggle the whiskers and then record blood flow in the somatosensory cortex. So when you wiggle the whiskers, blood flow goes up. In catacyl, this increase is reduced by about 50%. And we can rescue the blood, 
the deficit in blood flow in the castle mouse model within 15 minutes. And I'll show you that in a second. So one of the preparations we developed a few years ago, Fabrice Dabertron is now a tenure track faculty member at the University of Colorado in, uh, in Denver developed it. We took uh, arterials, which are single smooth muscle cell layer, mentioning smooth muscle cells, um, and their diameter is controlled by calcium entry through calcium channels with the capillaries attached. And these are cannulated. The red here is, um, is Ben Cherry and the smooth muscle cells. The green are the basal membrane staining with lectin. You can see capillary branches. So we can get a capillary branches that are about several hundred microns from the terminal, from the penetrating arterial. We then, um, we then can measure diameter and a pressurized arterial and stimulate the capillaries, which I'll show you in a second. Uh, also to show you how dynamic and sensitive the, the capillary endothelial immorectifier potassium channels are, we, um, Osama Haras, then in the lab, now an independent faculty member, looked at its regulation by GQPCR activation, which would chew up PIP2, and what he showed is it deactivates the channel over 10, 20 minutes. What I'll show you is this is actually ha has already happened in um, the catasol mouse model. And he used different agonists, the GQPCRs agonists that will then they basically do the same thing. So then with the, the Fabrice prep, we have a pressurized arterial from within the brain with the capillaries attached. We pico spritz potassium 10 millimolar onto the ends of the capillaries, and then we measure membrane potential and or diameter uh, about a millimeter away. And this is just shown here in the cartoon. And so here illustrates this would be coming, penetrating in from the cortex. This is the arterial, single smooth muscle cell layer, endothelial cells, and these are the capillaries. So if you can see from this movie, the arterial is about 15 microns in diameter. It's constricted by intravascular pressure. 10 millimolar potassium causes a rapid and essentially full dilation to, to almost 25 microns. And then take the potassium off and it goes back to the diameter. And if we measure membrane potential in the smooth muscle cells, which we did in this paper in Nature Neuroscience, this causes over a 25 millivolt hyperpolarization in the smooth muscle cells when potassium is applied here and almost full, full dilation. And the hyperpolarization starts within under 200 milliseconds. So then looking at the diameter and pico spritzing K on the capillaries, you'll see every time um, this was done, the arterial dilates, take it off, and you continue to do this and then apply a GQPCR agonist, which then chews up PIP2 to IP3 and diacylglycerol, and the dilations go down. If we then take off the GP GQPCR agonist, the dilations recover, showing how sensitive this mechanism is to the levels of PIP2. So this shows that PIP2 depletion suppresses KR2.1 signaling in the capillary endothelial cells by increasing PIP2 hydrolysis. Now we take the same prep, but from a catasol mouse. And what you can see here, and really striking, is that we stimulate the capillaries and there's no effect, unlike the previous movie I showed you. However, if Fabrice moved the pipette to the arterial, and pico spritz K onto the arterial, there's a profound dilation. So the defect is only in the capillaries, it's not in the smooth muscle, and it's a signal from the capillary endothelial cells to the smooth muscle cells. Now after PIP2, look, 15 minutes after PIP2, complete restoration of the capillaries um, signaling. I'll just show you one more time. Cadacil, this mechanism is defective, it's not working. Uh, the arteriolar response is intact.
Now we move, put PIP2 in the bath. Repeat, and they're completely restored function. When we did this in vivo, we also restored functional hyperemia in about 15 minutes by adding PIP2 IV to the mouse. So uh, what I love about people in the lab is that they never tell me anything. So Amrin Osama started a project in Alzheimer's mouse model, and I found out about a month, several months later. It's probably a good thing. Um, so basically, it's sort of the same theme emerges here. The increase in blood flow to whisker stimulation is reduced by about 50%, and PIP2 restores normal blood flow in a mouse model of Alzheimer's disease, which I'll show you now. Here's Amreen Osama. Uh, she's now assistant professor on the research track. He's assistant professor of tenure track. And so, um, so now we're looking at Alzheimer's mouse model. It's a 5X FAD mouse model. And a little bit about Alzheimer's, not to need to tell much folks much about it. That's accumulation of amyloid beta plaques, tau protein, neuronal cell loss, loss of cognitive function, uh, reduced cerebral blood flow and functional hyperemia and early defect, as I mentioned earlier. So the question, what happens to the capillary to arterial or smooth muscle electrical signaling in Alzheimer's disease? So we, th we think it's impaired, just like in Catacil. So we set out to test this. This is a transgenic mouse model that overexpresses five human mutations uh, familia, of familial Alzheimer's disease. You can see the time course. They have amyloid, beta plaques accumulating early, cognitive impairment early, neuronal cell loss at 12 months, and these experiments were done at 12 months. And this just shows the control and accumulation of beta plaques in the Alzheimer's mouse model. The next slide shows it um, another rendering of it in the Alzheimer's. And you can notice all the plaques decorate the blood vessels. This is a common feature of Alzheimer's that really has a large vascular component. So again, the technique, in this case it's illustrated, wiggle the whiskers, laser Doppler probe uh, uh, on, over the somatosensory cortex. Um, it measures the change in blood flow in, in, a, in a cortical volume, about a cubic millimeter. This shows someone else's experiment where they Wiggle the whiskers, neural activity in the barrel cortex, a rapid increase in cerebral blood flow. And again, this is, this is a characteristic of functional hyperemia. And one of the tools we use, uh, we've, we've done two things. One, we've knocked out the immorectified 2.1 out of all endothelial cells. So a good frat, over half the functional hyperemia is gone. Or we use barium, which is a pore blocker of the immorectifier. And it's rather potent. It seems to be it's rapid and it's fairly selective for the strong immorectifier family members blocking in the micromolar range. So it provides a convenient tool to look at um, um, the component that's due to the immorectifier 2.1. So here shows some recordings. It's pretty simple. Whiskers are wiggled. Blood flow goes up about 23% in the control. In the Alzheimer's mouse model, it's it goes up less it's reduced by more than 50 percent shown here and this shows the difference between the increase in blood flow to whisker stimulation sorry i think my things are sluggish here okay so then well uh, the delay here. Sorry. Okay. Then what we do is we add barium. Just look at the barium sense of component of the increase in blood flow, which is about 70, 60, 70 percent of it. So as you can see on the control, you add barium to the cranial window surface. The increase in blood flow is reduced by about 70%. And in the Alzheimer's mouse model, there's no effect of barium. So the residual component is the non-immorectifier component, which we're not sure what it is at the moment. 
shown here in the bar graphs. So Alzheimer's disease in this mouse model eliminates the inward rectifier sensitive component. So again, back to the picture of the inward rectifier with PIP2 there, just to show you. Now, interestingly enough, there's a, there's a very substantial literature from humans and mouse models for a deficit in PIP2 in Alzheimer's disease and in aging. Um, and so this, these results could be a partial, partial explanation for some of the defects that happen as a consequence of lower PIP2 and inositide metabolism. So the question, can giving PIP2 restore blood flow? So we do that. And this shows, again, 15 minutes after IV PIP2, the increase in blood flow now is restored to the control level. And it's a barrier sensitive component that's restored. As you can see here, baseline, deficit, PIP2, restoration, barium, it's a barium sensitive component. So to summarize things, um, normal electrical signaling and sensing of neural activity requires a strong more rectifier potassium channel and it's coactivator PIP2, generates electrical signal that moves and propagates rapidly upstream to cause dilation and lowering of calcium, I mentioned calcium, and an increase of blood flow into the capillary bed. In, in our Alzheimer's disease model, in small vessel disease model, Catacil, what we found was this, this component was gone, and hence the increase in blood flow to functional neural activity is, is greatly diminished. And what we found, it was due to a deficit in PIP2 that turns deactivates the strong rectifier. And when we give PIP2 back, IV, or isolated cells, or the ex vivo capillary arterial breath, we restore normal signaling. I just want to give a plug. We're getting a new research building um, and then the top floor of it. And then we just got a new grant to support young investigators, my co-investigator, Mary Cushman. So that was a picture a few months ago. Apparently, occupancy is in about, about a year. So, emerging thoughts, blue sky, speculation. Um, and here's my team, by the way. Uh, we're leading them, leading them astray. The holy grail, will restoration of normal cerebral blood flow control in small vessel disease and in Alzheimer's improve cognitive function? And when do you have to do it? It seems that PIP2 is a master regulator of cerebral blood flow by controlling the inward rectifier potassium channel. And it's re very sensitive to changes in um, GQPCR activity and in disease. Then the question, where are the druggable targets in the brain to restore function? And it, we apply PIP2 shown here, but it's also possibilities to apply the um, phosphatidyl inositol, the precursor, uh, or, um, you know, or PIP, or, or some other approaches that may in increase ATP levels, for example. So there are a bunch of possibilities that um, emerge, and we're, we're testing them at the moment. Um, and as I said, now for some completely different, that's the whole talk. Um, acknowledge people. Uh, Fabrice, I mentioned before, he's moved on to Colorado. This is our Leduc meeting in in uh, Munich, Fabrice is drinking wine. This is, Osama was instrumental in all these things, and we're at our lab meeting with um, Adam Greenstein at Hadrian's Wall on a nice February day. This is a Duke meeting again. Albert, he's now in Nevada, Masayo, Grove, back in Denmark. Fabrice drinking Guinness beer in Paris. Longtown collaborator David Hill Eubanks. The view at our lab window during the winter, Adam, again, and Susan Amar, near my house. And you tell my longtime collaborator into all the small vessel disease work. She won the brain prize with their colleagues, Luke Chabriot. This is the Prince of Denmark, the uh, brain prize, uh, Danish prize. Here's the lab, Lake Champlain. Funding agencies, NIH, American Heart, anybody that will give us money, we take. And to the future, this is what you shouldn't do, folks. Beautiful double rainbow, and I was driving down the interstate taking a picture. It's not smart, but thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, wonderful talk. Uh, I ask our discussion, Eric, is the, are there any questions yes. for Mark? Uh, well, I mean, given the, uh, the very, very beautiful talk, Mark, given the, the picture you showed, I should probably ask you about the airspeed of a swallow, but I will not. <laughs> um, uh, instead, uh, <laughs> I want to pass along a question from uh, Steve Cannon. And he, he says that um, you beautifully show PIP2 how PIP2 availability limits the uh, uh, KR2.1 activation uh, in the endothelial smooth muscle. But it, is this the case in all tissues um, or are there other tissues where like the PIP2 levels might be saturated? Um, yeah. There might be an excess of PIP2. And yeah, he, he, he mentioned something that Don Hilgeman had, had said before about that in skeletal muscle. But yeah, yeah. what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, thanks, um, uh, Steve. My name is Steve works it on in, on in skeletal muscle. That's the interesting thing. I think it's a common feature of all KR2 family members. They require PIP2, but keep in mind, skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle have the same channel, and yet they're subjected to norepinephrine and other GQPCRs, and they're, you know, the membrane potential doesn't collapse when they do that. So I think it's probably that the, the PIP2 balance of synthesis and, and hydrolysis is such that, you know, physiologically, you can't, when, the, when you go for a run, you don't like to have your heart and rectifier turn off and you, and you can no longer repolarize. So they must be set on another set point, uh, including smooth muscle. Yeah. Okay. And then um, uh, Dr. Fernando Santana, who I believe is a, a collaborator of yours, uh, going back. Um, asks, uh, what is the relationship between the action potential and changes in arterial diameter during a functional hyperemia? Yeah, that's a good, I, mean, I assume you mean, for now, you mean the, um, the neuronal action potential. Yeah. And that's a good sort of like question of, of which we haven't addressed, but to measure the neuronal action potential and measure um, next to a capillary and look at the upstream arterial and look at the sort of processing, the digital processing of how many action potentials translate into what duration signal and how long does it last. So sort of the processing from digital to analog to digital again. So it's a really interesting question, sort of information processing. And I don't have the answer at the moment. Check back next year, maybe. All right, and um, yeah, we've got a, several questions here, so make sure that you check it later. But um, uh, Dr. Burrs asks, um, does the PIP2 insert in extracellular leaflet and, and then flip to mediate the functional effects, or is uh, the EC leaflet uh, PIP2 sufficient? No, I don't know precisely, Don, um, but see the conventional way is we, we did this initially, is to put PIP2 into the pipette because it's an anion. So, but then we couldn't really translate it to our intact capillary arterial preparation or in vivo. So we just said, well, why don't we, somebody gave a talk on scramble aces at our, our place and uh, flip aces. I thought, we we'll just throw it on the outside. I mean, every membrane is full of flip aces and you're giving an infinite source. And, and the beauty of it is because it's an anion and in the bloodstream, it goes into the endothelial cell membrane first and it probably it does not go into the brain parenchyma. And so, you know, so, so we're now looking at sort of like scramblase knockouts and things to try to figure out what the transporter is, but it definitely works. Um, and it makes life a lot easier when you don't have to stick it in a pipette or inject it into a cell. Okay, and I have to, I have to pick and choose here given uh, the uh, amount of time that we have, but I'm trying to find people who haven't um, asked questions yet. Um, Eric Hernandez Ochoa asks, um, do you have any ideas on how to make the PIP2 repletion treatment, um, you know, cell types uh, specific or, you know, selective to uh, targeting these smooth muscle cells only? Um, that's a really good question. Um, the, right now, in our experiments, the deficit in PIP2 appears to be only in the capillary endothelial cells because we've measured other things in like the immorectifier in arterial or endothelial cells and in smooth muscle cells, and it's unchanged. So, um, and right now our approach of putting it in the bloodstream seems to selectively target the endothelium. Would that be practical therapeutically? I don't know. I, I should mention that lecithin over the counter 
contains PI, the precursor of PIP2, and they, they advertise it for improving cognitive function. And this is my prop. The bottle's empty. <laughs> and it still hasn't helped, but I'm working on it. <laughs> so we want to figure out, have a way that we can deliver a therapeutic. Maybe a precursor, maybe PI would be the way. Um, you know, were there other compounds that are already approved by the FDA that inc increase glycolysis, which is very important in endothelial cells to increase ATP. Mm -hmm. Our data indicate it's at the synthesis end, not the hydrolysis side. And um, um, Enrique uh, Jaimovic uh, wants to know, have you, whether you've tried any PLC inhibitors to, as a way to increase PIP2 and would, would that work? Um, yeah, we, we, we tried PLC inhibitors uh, on the catasol mouse model and um, it really doesn't look like it's hydrolysis, so it didn't so work. That's, that's good, yeah. Okay. Um, one more quick question before we move on. Uh, our previous speaker, Susan Ray, wants to know whether parasites are, are PIP2 sensitive. Oh, that's a good question. Uh, so, um, um, I don't know. Um, let me think. Um, well, we can restore function, at least in this aspect, we have, we're now uh, patch, patching parasites and looking at their currents. And so, um, and, um, looking to see if they have MR rectifiers and see if what's, what's happening. So we, I can't really answer at the moment. Uh, having said that, correcting the deficit in isolated endothelial cells from capillaries in our ex vivo prep, um, that corrects it. And so... Um, and as I said, I don't think that the PIP2 is making it in vivo to the pericytes because it would have to go into the endothelial cell membrane, move around, then be flipped out again to the pericyte. So, but I don't know. It's a really good question. Okay. 